Oh. Uh, now this lovely young lady has a PhD in psychology, uh, which makes for an interesting match with all the crazy password people in the audience, I would say. And she has done several talks at PasswordsCon before, and I'm absolutely sure she will do once again a perfect, magnificent talk about passwords and psychology. So. Just, uh, I will just leave the stage for Judy's pain, please. Okay, so um, as Per said, I'm Janice and uh, I'm a psychologist. Um, I've, this will be my third time at PasswordCon. I've given presentations before on the psychology behind the problem with passwords and um, about the decision-making processes in password practices. Uh, this year I'll be giving you the short tutorial where I hope to separate some of the truths from the half-truths about the psychology behind graphical passwords, which have been hailed as a usable alternative to text-based passwords, even though they haven't been widely adopted. And I should point out that this isn't my new research contribution or anything, but I do hope that you'll find it interesting and that you might be able to take something away from it. Also, I'm really nervous and I have a cold. So. <laughs> So what appears to be happening in social science is that people hear um, uh, an easy to describe uh, uh, interesting psychological phenomenon and then they run away with it, way off into the distance. And uh, an example that most of you have probably heard of is the magical number seven. For those of you who haven't heard of the magical number seven, in uh, 1956 George Miller, who was a psychologist, um, uh, put forward the argument and evidence to support it that if uh, the, he, the human mind could retain um, about seven chunks of information uh, in their immediate memory plus or minus two items. Um, uh, but the problem, uh, so, okay, so, yeah. Since then, it keeps getting used over and over again in all sorts of fields. People love this magic number seven. And the problem with that is that the magic number seven only really applies uh, to the cognitive processes involved in the retention of very simple stimuli um, <coughs> and not complex information processing that's otherwise involved in everyday tasks, which means it's often incorrectly and over-applied to many things. Um, and to, the same degree, the sa uh, to, to a similar degree, the same can be said for the psychology used to prop up graphical passwords. Um, and so with this in mind, uh, this is the structure of the tutorial. I'll give a brief background. Um, I won't go too much into the story of woe about passwords. We all know about it. Uh, I'll talk about uh, memory claims um, used to prop up graphical passwords, which will involve me talking about the picture superiority effect, will involve me talking about recall, will involve me talking about recognition. Then I'll talk about some of the potential problems with graphical passwords. Um, and then I will round up and answer any questions if I have time and should you have any. OK. so. Um, Okay, so uh, knowledge-based uh, authentication is the most common form of authentication, um, typically taking the form of a text-based password. And like I said, we're all very familiar with the story of Woe about the usability and security issues of passwords. And there are three main categories of solution um, for dealing with this. You could implement a biometric-based system. You can implement a token-based system. All right, pair. <laughs> implement a token-based system such as Pico, which I believe Frank has already talked about, and or you could just improve the current knowledge-based system, and graphical passwords are one proposed way of improving the knowledge-based system. <laughs> I love it when men creep up on me. <laughs> We got some. <laughs> it's just the way you did it as well. No, like... I <laughs> okay. Oh, now I can hear myself as well. Cool. Okay, so before I talk about why um, people hail graphical passwords as a, as a more usable alternative to text-based passwords, I should mention that there are three main types. Um, there's cognome cognometrics, which involve recognizing images um, amongst um, an array of other images. You have locometrics, which involves... Um, uh, clicking on target points within a single image. And then you have draw metrics, which involves recreating a drawing or a shape, uh, like you do in Android Unlock, for example. Uh, OK, so graphical passwords. Uh, there are two main claims used to prop up graphical passwords. Um, uh, but I'm not saying they're incorrect at this point or anything. And they might, uh, they're not necessarily independent of each other. 
First, we have the claim that pictures are remembered better and for longer than words because of the picture su superiority effect. And then we have the claim that recognition outperforms recall, which is only really relevant for cognometrics rather than the other two types of um, graphical passwords. And I'll look at these in more detail. So, studies um, have uncovered important differences in the way that pictures and words are processed um, and remembered. And in general, um, we have memory superiority for pictures um, uh, that's better than for words. So um, in a study by Nelson, for example, um, Nelson and colleagues, uh, if you uh, give people a long list of words and a long list of pictures, they'll remember about 10% of words after three days and 65% of pictures. Um, and so uh, the question is, why might this be the case? Um, well, first, people can grasp and remember concrete uh, concepts better than abstract ones. So if you give someone a picture of, of, a, of an object, that's a, that's, um, a concrete concept. And picture, concrete pictures tend to be better than con remembered better than concrete words, which are better remembered than abstract words. Second, pictures are more visually distinctive than words and produce a richer sensory perceptual representation in memory, making individual pictures stand out more. Third, pictures give the perceiver more direct access to meaning. Fourth, pictures are more elaborately um, are processed more elaborately in that any picture you see tends to be matched with prototypical images that you already have in your mind of the same category of thing. Um, and finally, pictures are proposed to access two memory stores, one verbal and one visual, which increases the uh, probability that you'll retrieve the memory of the picture. Um, arguably, the same can be said for words in that you can imagine a picture to go with the word, but that's less likely to occur um, as spontaneously as it does with pictures. So if I see a picture of a ball, I'm also more likely to think of the word ball. If I see the word ball, I'm less likely to um, think, of the, think of the picture that goes along with it. Okay, so many of these claims come from tests of episodic memory in which the participant is asked to recall a list of pictures or words. A typical recall test might ask you to um, memorize a list of words like on the slide here. Um, but, uh, and then to recall them later without any cues. And this might be okay with seven or so words like here, but the longer the list, uh, the harder it gets. Um, and this is because in a free recall test, you typically have very few cues to help you remember all the items appearing in the list, which is especially hard for items in the middle of the list. Um, and in this case, that would be words appearing next to the word father, which was in the middle here. Um, while words appearing at the beginning and the end will typically be remembered better due to well-documented primacy and recency effects. And the type of graphical password that relies more on free recall would be a draw metric scheme. Um, and as we know from research by Marcus and Marte, who was under pair last year, um, <clears throat> we knew that people can draw certain that people like to draw certain shapes and start in a certain location. So it's quite predictable. If you had more cues, uh, the material in the middle would be easier to remember, um, and in a lab-based setting, uh, this typically involves pairing words together so that when you show the participant one word, then they're more likely to remember the, the word that was paired with it. And, and in uh, the typographical password that relies more on cued recall would be um, a locometric or a click point um, type password. And again, we know in the password community that people will often choose points um, uh, that are very similar to each other. So um, if you've got a picture of a face, then most people in this room, one of their points that they click will be the face in that picture. Um, and finally, we have recognition, which is the most likely to result in memory retrieval because there is a full copy of the word that you're trying to remember in the queue. And this is what cognometric graphical passwords like Passface rely on. <coughs> Bless you. <laughs> Uh, the argument uh, when it comes to graphical passwords, um, especially cognometric passwords, uh, is uh, twofold. First, uh, recognition is uh, better than recall, although not always, um, and that's because it relies on implicit and, and automatic memory processes. So, for example, it would be easier for you to recognize a picture of your own country than it would be to draw it from your memory in all its detail. Um, and uh, second, uh, our capacity for recognizing images is greater than our capacity for recognizing words. And in fact, Standing, um, who tried to find our upper limits of recognition memory, found that we could recognize 10,000 pictures um, the following day. Um, and he measured this by getting people to tell what was old and what was new um, uh, from, a, from a list. 
Um, however, we might not want to place too much emphasis on this, um, since others, uh, such as Shepard in 1967, also found that re word recognition was very accurate. It was 90% accurate um, if you force participants to make a choice. Standing himself also found that despite greater accuracy with pictures, the retrieval time for words was better. And also, many of these experiments only involve distinguishing old pictures from new pictures, um, which does not necessarily mean that the participant actually remembers the picture um, and all the details of the picture. So, th thanks. <laughs> I look good today. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay, um, I'll describe um, an analogy for you to get across the point, and it's called the butcher on the bus scenario. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what uh, inspired this, this analogy, but here it is nonetheless. Um, a man gets on the bus, he sees someone he recognizes, he knows instantly that he recognizes him, but he cannot for the life of him know where he's, where he's met him, what his name is. Later on, he's in the supermarket, he goes to pick up a, uh, you know, a piece of meat, and then he starts to think, oh wait, <laughs> I know where I know this guy from. He's the butcher from my local, from my, from my local butcher. Um, and, uh, and so what happened here was that on the bus, he got this uh, feeling that he knew the guy, which is uh, recognition. Um, but later on, he had to go for a conscious retrieval process uh, where he actually re recollected um, where he had seen this guy before. Um, so, um, now, if we substitute the butcher for a graphical password, you may be familiar with some pictures. You may go, I know that picture from somewhere. Um, but you don't necessarily know all the details, like what order your pictures go in, or for what services that you're supposed to be using what type of pictures for. So um, what I'm talking about here is uh, knowing the difference between knowing and actually remembering something. Like I said, uh, knowing is fast-hitting feeling, um, and in comparison, uh, recollecting is, uh, a, in comparison in terms of like how fast your brain works, is a slow conscious process. Um, and so can we really say that pictures are actually being remembered when we talk about graphical passwords? Um, and this is important because um, the user of a graphical password has to do more than simply recognize images. They have to remember things like the order of the mouse clicks or how the shape was drawn. And you may well end up with some of the same problems associated with the proliferation of traditional passwords in terms of usability and security. Um, uh, for example, if you let users choose their own passwords, they tend to choose quite predictable graphical passwords, just as they do pick predictable text-based passwords. Uh, these passwords tend to be lower in entropy. Just like text-based passwords also, they can be shoulder surfed, and they can be stored and shared um, by just taking a picture of it with your smartphone. And uh, additionally, uh, despite claims of uh, graphical passwords being more user-friendly, they tend to take longer to log in with, and so people don't really like using them. And finally, if graphical passwords became widely adopted, users would have to remember a different graphical password for each site, which could lead to errors and interference, just as text-based passwords lead to errors and interference. In fact, just like verbal memory, visual memory representations are subject to interference by items that are categorically similar. Although interestingly, according to Conkle and colleagues at least, um, the perceptual distinctiveness of an image, such as color and shape, uh, has little impact on um, interference. Um, and so this means that what we already know affects our, affects our memories. Um, and only with a detailed conceptual knowledge, such as, you know, you know, this is a red sports car and that's a red racing car. Um, only with uh, this detailed knowledge are we able to maintain detailed representations in our minds um, that we can then later ac um, accurately retrieve. So uh, given all this information, uh, if you take nothing else from this presentation, I want it to be that there are always caveats uh, wherever a psychological theory or phenomenon is used to justify anything. Um, so uh, even visual memory has limits, which means that even graphical passwords have limits, even though the psychology underpinning graphical passwords might be correct. Um, okay, so in summary, I got there a lot quicker. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, many of the claims um, made by um, people to uphold graphical passwords are not in themselves incorrect. Um, recognition is generally better than recall, and there is such a thing as a superiority effect. But while it is true that a lot of information can be stored in visual long-term memory, both in terms of the number of items and the level of detail per item, 
there are a number of ifs and buts. And these are the ifs and buts. If graphical passwords were to be widely distributed, there's still room for interference and error, um, both uh, between images in a single thing and between, and between services. Um, you might get confused about the order that they go in or the, the, the order that the clicks go in. I would also caution how much emphasis you, play, you place on recognition um, being better than recall. And finally, we should keep in mind that visual memory capacity is intrinsically tied to what we know about what we're seeing. Um, and without this knowledge, people maintain only a just like rep representation um, of, of what they're seeing, uh, which is separated from the perceptual detail. So again, the, uh, the take home message for me is that whenever you hear about some psychological theory or phenomenon being used to justify a design, a design decision, don't just take it at face value. Um, the psychology might be correct, but the conclusions drawn um, might be incorrect or invalid, and there is usually a bigger picture to consider. Thank you. So there has to be questions for this one. Of course, but you're telling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and just a little mm -hmm. bit nervous this time as well? I was very nervous. Very nervous. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just got... <laughs> I just, think that came across a bit. The first time, you know, the first time Janice did a talk, I have to say this, the first time Janice did a talk back in Belgium and over Island, she also finished in like record time. The entire audience was like, you know, in a way, I, I'm, I'm going to say starstruck because we had never had a talk from a psychologist before about these things. You know, your ability or disability or, you know, to, to remember passwords and there are so many things related to this that, you know, us as security people don't know about that I think we should know about. And also on the topic of graphical password schemes, in Las Vegas, when I did a conference in Las Vegas in the beginning of August, uh, a friend of mine in the US named Mark Burnett did a talk there about graphical password schemes and how he essentially hates them. And one of his slides actually shows that on his count, there are more than, more than 19,000 patents in the world now for different types of graphical password schemes, believe it or not. And even more are coming, unfortunately. <laughs> but questions for Janice? Jeff. Of uh, well, first of all, thank you for, correct, for, for taking the opportunity to correct people about, I mean, George Miller's paper was excellent, groundbreaking, all of that, but mm -hmm. a long time ago. But anyway, <laughs> separate thing. Um, I, my intuition, based on no data whatsoever, mm -hmm. is that uh, there will actually be more interference with graphical passwords than with lexical ones, uh, particularly because things that are done with the text-based ones, the words, these are made up of combinatorial units, while graphical things can often be more analog. Mm. Um, you know, they, you know, they move along a continuum instead of are you using this letter versus that letter. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if there's any would... research to either support or contradict my intuition. There may be research on it. I'm not actually. I've, I'm. I don't actually study memory or anything. Um, oh. But there may be research on it. But I would actually probably, if I were to go with an estimated, uh, sorry, an educated guess, I'd actually disagree with you and probably say that there's more interference with words because um, words you have to be able to interpret first before um, you get to the meaning. Whereas the picture is directly, you get directly to the meaning immediately. Um, but, uh, and also with words, you can get you know, letters mixed up, which is, you know, or you can have very semantically, you know, sleep and snooze. If you get people to remember those two, and they're more likely, or get them to remember sleep, and then you show them the word snooze, they're more likely to say that they saw the word snooze. Where if you give, get a picture of you know, someone sleeping this way or that way, then I would guess, but I don't have anything uh, to support that, that you would find it easier to tell the difference between the two images than between snooze and sleep. This okay. Yeah, I've got a reference for you here. You're on here. You're at the bottom there, near.
is that if you, whether you remember or you know, if you see it and you recognize it, you should click on it. So this makes interference a really big problem, that if you see the same image in the set of images used for your bank and for your email, um, that you sort of have to remember an extra piece of information, oh, I clicked the Apple when it's the bank, but not. So it no longer is recognition. Mm -hmm. So managing those images and um, working to prevent this becomes very difficult, very, very fast with the passwords. Um, but it's much easier with your Q recall type scheme, so there's only one image to recall. Um, and so as to whether there's less or more, it's hard to know, but it's definitely a bigger management problem um, as you rely on more. Gentlemen in the middle, next to you in the script. Do you have a question? Uh, Same thing, okay. More questions? Yeah. Do you have any data on the entropy uh, that can be garnered from the There are papers about the entropy of graphical passwords, but I don't have any personally myself. More questions? Calvin, Adam, towards? If you've got someone adopts a graphical password, a password technique, any studies into improving over usage and time? Yeah, that's one of the main um, uh, limitations to these studies. Uh, they often do them immediately. It's the same with word recognition tests as well. They often do them immediately afterwards. I'm sure there are studies where they uh, do it over a, a certain um, period of time, but I haven't had enough time to read all the papers out there. So I've got two pages of reference, two slides of references, but that's all I read for this presentation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I obviously, I obviously have my undergrad psychology knowledge of memory as well, but uh, that's it. That's it. Of, hey, we read this one paper about psychology, and mm -hmm. now we built our whole product. Around. Yeah, yeah. And it's not just passwords; it's everything. Yeah. In my case, I see a lot of it in education. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we wanted to push back and maybe have um, some touch points for where to start discovering and asking questions. Um, are yeah. there specific places that you could point us to? Um, I, I think or just questions we should ask. I think what you need is you need a multidisciplinary team where there's a mutual respect for every member in the team and you need a psychologist on the team, you need a programmer on the team um, because what because uh, otherwise you would have to become an expert in psychology. Um, and the problem is, is that many of the, the things that they use, for example, when I worked for NCR, um, it, all the technology adoption stuff talks about specifically one type of, it talks about um, the theory of reasoned action or they'll talk about uh, you know, low level processing and deep level processing, but they'll, they'll talk about the most famous model and not a more recent model or a model that's more appropriate. And if you uh, employ an actual psychologist, then they'll be able to tell you there are other models. Um, but what happens is that you see it in one paper and then you think it's you know, legitimate to just you know, reference that one and then it just happens over and over and over again. So it doesn't just happen in, with passwords, it happens with human computer interaction and usability as well. So um, I would just say um, interact more and talk more to each other and stop uh, believing that what you know is, is, the, is the only thing that can possibly be correct. So that's what, that was my advice anyway. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, it's you that's picking people, sorry. Yeah. Um, is there any research done on aging? Of, on, of in, aging? Aging, in particular, um, I'm thinking of a, a research question, password reset question. What's your favorite color? Uh, I have to remember what the favorite color I had when 10 you were, years ago yeah. when I registered for the account. Mm. Is there any research on how long people can recall the images? Uh, probably. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there, there, there is a fun paper that I would, uh, I would say maybe it's a little bit related. It's, it's a, a pretty new one. Uh, uh, Joseph Bonnell, who used to study here with Frank, and some other people in the US uh, at Google, they looked into security uh, uh, questions and answers from Google, from people all around the world. And something as simple as, you know, what is your favorite food? And they found that, well, that really depends on, first of all, what kind of food do you like? Depends on, what, on which part of the country, yeah, or the part of the world you live in. But not only that, but in some countries, they have a much wider selection of food. So they found that in some countries, remembering what is your favorite food as a security question would be a lot harder to recall than in other countries. So, kind of fun. But that was the last one. Uh, I will again say thank you to Janice, and we'll have a next speaker in three minutes. Thank so, thank you, Janice. Thanks.